So my experience at ThoughtWorks started in 2005. Uh, and the first project I worked on was at a large ISP. This is the company when your grandfather wants the internet, he puts the CD into his uh, computer, and then he puts in his credit card details, and he has the internet, and he can send you lots of boring pictures of cruises that he's been on and so forth. And this company had a system for adding new users that was written in Perl. But one of their um, architects went to play golf with somebody from WebLogic, and so they decided they needed to rewrite the system in J2EE. And they started building this J2EE system, and they were finding it hard because nobody had experience in Java, and they hired ThoughtWorks to help them build this system. And we had uh, several reasonably sized teams. There was about 50 people in all. And they were building on Windows laptops, but deploying to Solaris. And this is Java, which is platform independent, so nothing can possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> we were somewhat concerned, and indeed, the first time we tried to deploy the system to a production like hardware, um, this was about three months before go live, the deployment failed. Uh, it took us two weeks to deploy the system, and when we deployed it, it didn't work. So that was embarrassing. And we found several problems with the system. The architecture uh, did, didn't really work on, on a cluster. People would store data to the file system, and that works fine on a Windows laptop. Uh, on a Solaris cluster, you store the data on one node, you try and read it on another node, it's a different file system, the data's not there. So to fix that problem, we had to use NFS. And there were a number of other problems that we found, and it was late in the project, it was expensive to fix them. Even when we had fixed them, it was, it was taking several days for us to get builds uh, to a testing environment, so testers could test uh, that build. And then after maybe two, three weeks, finally the developers would get feedback on the, on the software they'd written. I don't know about you, I can barely remember what I was doing yesterday. So trying to remember three weeks ago to some software I'd written, you get a bug report, you're trying to reproduce the bug, that's hard, the system has changed, hopefully, in, the, in those two or three weeks. Um, some of those people have got married or gone on holiday or quit or whatever. So it's very painful to get this feedback so late. And then the actual deployment was scheduled for a weekend, for two days, which is already bad. I mean, nobody wants to be in a data center at the weekend. But we couldn't even manage that because it was taking us so long to deploy the system. So we decided to automate the hell out of the build and deploy process and we already had an automated script, it was 8,000 lines of ant. And so we went to the operations team and said, here's our 8,000 lines of ant, how do you like that? And uh, yeah, they weren't very enthusiastic. In fact, they were operations people, so they were actually quite rude. And we asked them, what, what, what technique would you like us to use? What, what, what technology? And they said, we'd like to use Bash. So we said, OK, and we built them a system to deploy this, uh, this system in Bash. It was called Conan the Deployer. <laughs> and so you would start Conan, and you would give it the tag in CVS to build off, and you would give it the name of the environment to deploy to, and Conan would arise and smite to WebLogic and check out the configuration from CVS and configure WebLogic, configure Apache, deploy the system. And so over the course of a couple of months, we got the, the, the deployment time down to one hour and you could cut over and cut back in less than a second. And so the first release went pretty well, uh, it succeeded, and then nobody had to come in at the weekend ever again. So that was great. You could do deployments during the day, um, and it made a huge difference to the ability of the team to get feedback on what they were building. So I thought this was an unusual company, that these people were a little bit backward, and that most other people were much better at this kind of thing. And my subsequent eight years in ThoughtWorks was discovering that this was not, in fact, the case, and that this situation was pretty typical. And what you often find is companies want to go agile, and often some senior executive will decide to go agile, and the first victim of the agile transformation is the engineering team. And so the certified scrum masters come in, and everybody gets the two-day course, and suddenly everybody's taking orders standing up rather than sitting down. And that huge backlog of work that can't ever be completed is now prioritized and estimated. And now we're agile. Yay! And you've ticked the agile box. Hooray. Now, who's, who's experienced this, by the way? Anyone experienced <laughs> Wow. <laughs> So unfortunately, this is very common. And it, I don't want to blame Scrum. Um, I want to blame the people who implement Scrum. Uh, and 
the thing is, right, even if you get some engineering practices implemented, so you're doing these nice iterations where you're doing analysis and development and testing, that stuff's not actually getting released to users. You have to wait till you're dev complete with all the software, and then it gets thrown over the wall to the testing team who test it. And if you're really lucky, you manage to fix some of the bugs. And then the whole thing gets thrown over the wall again to the operations team, and they have to try and somehow make this stuff work. And often, you know, that, that's pretty painful. So it turns out most of the volatility in the software delivery process comes after dev complete between dev complete and live. And we sometimes call this the last mile, although this is Europe, so it's the last kilometer. Sorry about that. Um, the problem is the software doesn't actually deliver any value at all until this point at the end. This is where your work starts actually delivering value. And that's problematic. This is actually the beginning of the life of your system, not the end, the beginning. And the question is, can we do better? And the answer is, well, yes, of course we can do better. If you go to code.flickr.com and you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you can see this automatically generated report. And this was in 2009, 2010. And you can see that these people are deploying more than 10 times a day. Now, when Flickr was acquired by Yahoo, the Yahoo team had a much more traditional change management process. And they said, OK, you crazy Flickr kids. Uh, you're not doing this nonsense, continuous deployment stuff. You're going to use our proper change management process. And the guy who was in charge of Flickr, a guy called John Allsport, uh, he spoke to his boss, uh, uh, Yahoo, who turned out to be a nice, reasonable guy, and said, well, listen, let us carry on doing this for a bit, and let's see how it goes. And John went away and did some analysis on the uptime of Flickr and Yahoo. And what he found was that Flickr had a higher uptime than any of Yahoo's major services. So the first thing I want to do is kill this myth that throughput and stability are opposed, that they're somehow a zero-sum game. This is not true. If you do this stuff right, you can get improved throughput and increased stability at the same time. And I'll explain why in just a minute. But before I go into more details, I want to examine why do we care about releasing more frequently? What's the point? Well, the number one thing is to actually make sure we're building the right thing. A number of studies have been done on the software delivery process. Uh, and I mean, there was famously a report delivered at XP 2002 by the Standish Group, who do the chaos report. And what they found is this really shocking statistic. Far more than 50% of functionality in software is rarely or never used. These aren't just marginal value features. Many are zero value features. The biggest source of waste in software development and product development is stuff that we build that's never used or rarely used. Think about it. 50% of the time that you're working, you could be on the beach. And you would deliver the same value to your customers. So what are we doing? It's crazy. And the problem is this. Most of the time when we're building custom software, when we're doing custom software development, the only good reason to do custom software development is if you're developing something innovative, if you're doing something creative and unusual. That's when you need to build custom software. And most of the time, we make this mistake of, of asking our customers what they want. And the problem is, our customers don't know what they want. There's a great quote from Steve Jobs. He says, you can't just ask customers what they want and then try to give that to them. By the time you get it built, they'll want something new. And Henry Ford, uh, there's an apocryphal quote from Henry Ford that nobody has actually attributed successfully, um, that what he said was, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. So customers don't know what they want. And the most dangerous customers are the ones that think they know what they want. That's the worst. So the question is, how do we decide what to build? And it turns out this is a problem that's been solved I mean, I, I come from a background in physics, and it turns out in physics we learn all this really useful stuff. And the most important thing we learn is the scientific method. So who's uh, heard of Eric Ries or the Lean Startup? OK, a few of you. So Eric Ries worked in Silicon Valley, and uh, he's written this book called The Lean Startup. And what he says is this. What we should do is apply the scientific method to product development. When we have an idea, some, some innovation 
that depends on us creating some software, the most expensive way to test that hypothesis, that business idea, is to actually build the product. That's really expensive, and it takes ages. Instead, what we need to do is work out how to build the smallest possible amount of stuff to validate if our hypothesis is correct. So Eric Ries worked at a startup called MVU, and they built 3D avatars for chat. And he built integrations with 11 different instant messaging systems. And it took them six months to build this system. And you know, he, he was worried about the quality. There were some bugs. And he was really worried about releasing it. And when he released it, he was very nervous. And it turned out he didn't need to be nervous at all, because not one single person downloaded the software. They released it. And there was a link that says, click here to download. Not one single person clicked on that link. So actually, the cheapest way for him to test his business idea would have been to create a static HTML page. And when you click on that link, it goes to a 404. And that would have taken about an hour if he was careful with the CSS and made it look really nice. <laughs> so that was a waste of six months. And often, this is what happens in real life. So you know, as a result of that, he, he says, work out what the smallest possible amount of work you can do is to test your idea, get feedback, and repeat. And what we want to do is go around this loop, build, measure, get real data from customers by experimenting on them, not by asking what they want, but by running experiments on them, and gathering data, and then working out what to build next. And what we want to do is optimize our software delivery process for time around this loop. We want to optimize our software delivery process for time around this loop. And this, this measure is called lead time. And so when we optimize our software development process for lead time, something peculiar happens. And it's not normally the way that we work. And it's important to ask this question. How long would it take your organization to deploy a change that involved one single line of code? Do you do this on a repeatable and reliable basis? Logging into production and editing files with VI doesn't count. That's cheating. <laughs> Emacs is slightly better. Notepad is right out. So a lot of people don't even know what this number is. And when they do, often they become depressed. But something else interesting happens when you optimize your process for lead time. It actually reduces the risk of release. If you're releasing every three months, the batch size, the amount of stuff you're releasing is large. And that means there's a lot of stuff that could go wrong. And when there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong, normally something does go wrong. So if you release much more frequently, the amount of stuff you release is much lower. And what that means is it's easier to find out what went wrong. It's easier to fix that problem. And you get to practice releasing all the time. And when we practice something a lot, we get really good at it. So fundamentally, what we want to do is optimize our software development process so we produce systems that are optimized for mean time to restore service. When something goes wrong, first of all, you want to find out, not via Twitter, but via a monitoring system that detects when you have a problem with your software. Then you want to do the smallest possible amount of work to find out how you're going to fix the problem. And then you want to fix the problem, and then you do a post-mortem to, to find the root causes and make sure that problem can't happen again. The reason Flickr had that high uptime is because it was super easy for them to find out why, A, when their service had gone down, B, what, why their service had gone down, because they were only releasing changes of about 50 to 100 lines of code at one time. Well, the changes in these 50 lines of code, or this Apache configuration setting, or this database thread pool setting. Really easy to find the problem, really easy to fix it, and you practice deploying all the time. Fundamentally, there's two approaches to systems design. You could optimize for mean time between failures or mean time to restore service. And it's like the decision you make when you buy a car. Now, you could buy a BMW. When you buy a BMW, you pay a lot of money. And you pay that money because it doesn't go wrong. When it does go wrong, it's going to be very expensive to fix. But that's OK, because it doesn't go wrong. On the other hand, you could buy a Jeep. Now, a Jeep is going to go wrong all the time. They're famous for it. They're always going wrong. 
but it doesn't matter because it's really cheap to fix and you can fix it really, really quickly. There's a video from a unit of the Canadian Armed Forces where they strip down a Jeep and rebuild it in less than two minutes. You can find it on YouTube. I recommend you go and watch this. If you search for Canadian Army Jeep reassembly, you can find this video. It's brilliant. Now, if you're building space hardware or embedded medical devices, in that case, you need to think very, very hard about mean time between failures. Who in this room is working on space hardware or embedded medical devices? So you need to think about <laughs> mean time to restore service. That, and, and most people don't. Most people optimize for this side. They're like, we mustn't have our system ever fail. And that's actually a bad optimization to make in most cases. And, and really good systems will incorporate elements of both. The third reason to release frequency, uh, release more frequently, is that it's the only real measure of the progress of your projects. If you go to a developer and you say to the developer, are you done with this piece of functionality? The developer might say yes. And you might say, are you done or are you done done? Because those are two completely different things, right? Done means it works on my machine. Done done means it works in production. And as we saw earlier, most of the pain and volatility of software development comes between dev complete and live in production. Who's a project manager in this room? Any project managers? OK. So for everyone else in the room, you've installed Windows, right? In Windows, there's a progress bar. And the progress bar gets to about 80%, and then it stops moving. <laughs> and you go and get a cup of tea, and you bring back your cup of tea, and it's still at 80%. And you think, well, shall I get another cup of tea, or shall I reboot? You know, what shall I do, or should I install Linux? Um, and, and this is actually what being a project manager feels like, because you have a project plan, and you're asking people, are you done? OK, we have, we have progress in our projects. And you get to 80%, and then you start doing performance testing. And then you find out that the system won't won't support the expected load. There's a security problem. There's an architecture problem. We need to change everything. You show it to the customer. The customer says, that's crap. I don't want that at all. We have to change everything. This is how it feels. The only real measure of done is live in production. And so it's important to have a chart like this. This is called a burn-up chart or a cumulative flow diagram. Who has these on their projects? OK, uh, a number of you. And they're, they're very important. So. This gray line here is scope, and of course, that line only ever goes in one direction, right? And so this red line here means work starts. You start building a particular piece of functionality, or, or, or you start fixing a bug or something. And then crucially, you have this green line, and the green line means done, done, live in production. Um, and it's important that you actually have that line. And this graph tells you two important pieces of information at a glance. The horizontal distance between the red line and the green line, that's your lead time from starting work to live in production. And the horizontal distance on the y-axis between those two lines is batch size or work in process, the amount of stuff you're doing at any one time. And you can see intuitively there's a strong connection between those two numbers. And it turns out if you want to reduce cycle time, you can increase capacity, you know, add more people to your project. You can reduce demand, in other words, reduce the scope. But you know, the mythical man month says that increasing capacity, you know, it's like trying to speed up a pregnancy by having nine women getting pregnant rather than one. It doesn't work. And in the same way, you know, we've seen it's hard to reduce demand because this scope line only ever goes in one direction. The easiest way to reduce cycle time is to reduce batch size, to work on less stuff at any one time. And this is why Kanban is important, because the whole point of Kanban is to reduce work in process. And so by implementing Kanban and being careful about managing work in process, you can reduce cycle time. So uh, Dave and I were trying to think about what to call the book we wrote. And we're very bad with names. We were, I was in a band called the Chutney Ferrets once. And um, we were reading the Agile Manifesto. And the Agile Manifesto has four trade-offs. You know. Um, Working software is more important than comprehensive documentation and so forth. But there's also 10 principles. And the first principle of the Agile Manifesto is this. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And when I saw this, 
it was obvious what I should call the book. Valuable software. No, that's not right. Continuous delivery. And so when you think about continuous delivery and optimizing for cycle time, it changes the way that your project works. The narrative arc of your project changes. And instead of having this kind of very scrum full uh, kind of phase gate process, what you do instead is you approach it quite differently. You start with an inception. And the job of the inception is to decide on the minimum viable product. So everyone in the room, whether UX, business people, developers, testers, and you want to try and have all the roles in the room, although not make it too many people. You only need a few people. Work out what the minimum viable product looks like and work out how you're going to measure the value of what you build. That's really important. Have some way to measure the value of what you build. And then you start building it. And you release the minimum viable products, maybe not to the whole world, but maybe to a small group of people, an alpha group, or show some people what you've done, get real data, and then iterate and build more features based on that customer feedback. And so there's two big changes. Firstly, your software is always production ready. All the way through the life cycle, you focus on keeping your software production ready. And you make sure that your system is always working. And keeping the system working is more important than doing work. And then when you do that, a really magical thing happens. Releases become tied not to your operational constraints, to how fast IT can move, but instead to your business. Instead of the business coming to IT and saying, there's a new project, here's the requirements, boom. And then you know, go away for six months and wait for IT to build the thing. Oh, IT is so slow. It's so boring to wait for them. Instead of doing that, you work out the minimum viable product. A few weeks' work, maybe a couple of months, but no more than that. And you go and build that, and then you go to the business and say, well, these are the results. What should we do next? OK, let's take that idea. Let's build a few days, maybe a week's worth of stuff, get some data. What should we build next? And in, you're always asking the business, what should we build next? What should we build next? And so IT is no longer the constraint. The constraint is, how fast can we come up with ideas and test them? Anybody who's moved to this way of working, they love it. Nobody wants to go back to the old way of doing things. Nobody says, I wish we could move back to six-month releases. That was great. <laughs> Neither IT nor the business. Nobody does that. So how do we achieve this? What we want is fast, automated feedback on the production readiness of the systems any time you make any kind of change. So we're quite good at testing code changes. You know, We have automated tests that we run as part of continuous integration. But I can bring down a production system really quickly by changing a configuration setting. If I change an Apache setting, I can bring down a system like that much faster than changing code. It takes ages to break the system by changing the code. You have to build it. You have to test it. It has to get deployed. It takes you waiting forever. But why don't we test those changes, those configuration changes, with the same rigor that we test our source code changes? It's crazy. We should be testing all these changes, database schema changes, environmental configuration changes, configuration changes, with the same rigor that we test our source code changes. And that feedback should go to everyone. So there's three kind of pillars to continuous delivery. One is automation of almost everything. Certainly, the build, deploy, test, release process should be automated. There's still uh, an important place for people, things like exploratory testing, usability testing, showcases, but not in building and regression testing deployment. My colleague Neil Ford has a joke that when humans do the things that computers could do instead, all the computers get together late at night and laugh at us. And regression, manual regression testing is the best example of this. Second, a set of patterns and practices. Now, nothing that I'm talking about today in continuous delivery is really new. This is all stuff that people have been talking about for many years. And indeed, Kent Beck was deploying once a day to production on a project he was working on in the late 90s. So none of this stuff is really new. What's changed is we've developed new patterns and practices, and we have new tools that enable us to do this. And the third ingredient, uh, the third pillar, I should say, is collaboration between everyone involved in the process of developing and delivering software. UX, test, the business, engineering, operations, support. All these different areas need to work together very closely. So what are the ingredients? Number one, configuration management. I should be able to add capacity to my production system in the following way. I should be able to take a new box, plug it into the rack, 
plug in the power, plug in the network, and have a fully automated process that Pixie boots it, installs the OS, installs any middleware, configures that stuff, deploys the correct version of the application to the box, configures it, and then tells the router to start sending traffic to that box and serving transactions. That should be a fully automated process. It should be possible for me, as, say, a tester, to put a box on my desk, plug in the network, the power, keyboard, mouse, screen, and run a single command to check out from version control everything I need to build and test the software, and run a single command to deploy that to any environment that I have access to. Now, you're not going to get there straight away. It's not easy, and none of this stuff is easy, but this is what we want to be aiming for. Martin Fowler has uh, a test. Uh, he has a blog entry about, is it the Phoenix server one? Yeah, so where he talks about doing a test of your business continuity process for your organization. And the test works like this. Martin comes into your server farm with a sidekick and starts going about the servers with an ax and a machine gun and a water pistol, and the whole thing you know, blows up. And the test is, how long does it take you to restore service? And if you've got really great configuration management, you should be able to restore service in a known time, in a deterministic time, because you can take everything from version control, provision new boxes in deterministic time, and restore the data and have the system up and running again. The second ingredient is continuous integration, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail, along with automated testing. So continuous integration. Who here does continuous integration? Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Keep your hand up. Right up. Okay, put your hand down if not everybody on your team checks into trunk at least once a day. If that's not true, put your hands down. Otherwise, keep your hands up. Okay, now if not every check-in results in a build and the tests running, put your hands down. Otherwise, keep your hands up. Okay, so only the people with their hands up are really doing continuous integration. Thank you. Continuous integration is not running Jenkins against your feature branches. Continuous integration is a practice or an attitude, not a tool. And for everybody else in the room, it looks like this. I build something on my local workstation, and I I'm finished. I'm done. So at that point, I run the tests, run the build and run the tests to make sure that I haven't done anything dumb. And it goes green, which is great. At that point, I want to check to see if what I'm doing conflicts with what other people on my team have been doing. So somebody else might have written something that conflicts with my work. So I pull from mainline, uh, from tip, and I merge, and I run the build and the test again. And because I'm really great, it goes green, and they pass. At that point, I'm ready to share my work with the rest of the team. So I push into trunk, and that triggers a run of the build and the unit test. And because I'm really awesome and probably need a pay rise, um, it goes green. And then I can say that I'm really done. Not done done, but properly done. And so this is the life cycle. And, and there's a number of different th things that we care about. For example, you know, people have to pay attention when the bill goes red and actually fix it. But the most important rule to follow is that everyone actually commits to the main line at least once a day. And if you're good at, I mean, really good at what you're doing, you should be checking in multiple times a day. You should be writing some code. First of all, writing some tests, then writing some code, and then you check in, and then you refactor, then you check in, and you do this multiple times a day. So that's the, kind of, that's the process of continuous integration. So now I want to talk a bit about testing. My favorite quote about testing comes from this guy, W. Edwards Deming. Who's heard of Edwards Deming? OK, a few of you. So he was instrumental in um, turning around Japanese industry after the Second World War. Uh, and even today, there's a Deming Prize given to the people who've made the biggest contribution to quality in Japanese industry. And then uh, Toyota kicked the ass of all the American auto companies really badly. And suddenly, everyone wanted Deming to come and, and, and help them too. And in fact, Deming went on to help Ford fix uh, some of their manufacturing problems. So this is what Deming says about quality. Ooh, fizzy. Deming says, cease dependence on mass inspection to achieve quality. Improve the process and build quality into the product in the first place. And this has, I mean, this is a manufacturing quote, but it has two important implications for software delivery. Number one, testing is not something we do after development. Testing is something we should be doing all the time. 
the cheapest way to fix a bug is not to check it into version control in the first place. That's why we have unit tests that we run before we check in. The second important implication is this. Testers and QAs are not responsible for quality. Everyone is responsible for quality. Now, testers and QAs have a vital role on the software development team. Their job is to represent the user and to make the quality of the system transparent so that the team can then make a decision on what to do. Now, if you're building a, a new product and you're doing it in a lean startup kind of way, you may trade off quality in order to get feedback more quickly. And that may be the right business decision to make for your organization. But that's a business decision. And in order to make that decision, your testers need to make the quality of the system transparent so you can decide what to do. Quality is a decision, a business decision that the team has to make, and everyone is responsible for making that decision together. So there are many different kinds of testing. Uh, Brian Marrick has this diagram where he describes the different kinds of tests that we can do. And in the bottom left, there's unit tests, component tests, and these are technology-facing tests that support programming. These are the tests that developers write to validate that the system behaves in the way that they expect. Up in the top right, and this should all be automated. Up in the top right, a business-facing test that critique the project. And these are manual tests that you need your human beings for. So showcases, usability testing, exploratory testing, you can't automate that stuff. That's what your humans, your expensive, valuable humans should be doing. On the bottom right here are what's laughingly called non-functional tests. I think this is hilarious because if your system goes down because the load is too high and the architecture can't cope with the load, often you might describe the system as non-functional, just saying. So we prefer to use the term cross-functional instead. But these are the illities, you know, uh, business continuity, availability, scalability, um, security, and so forth. And a lot of this stuff can be tested. You can do uh, automated penetration testing. You can do static analysis to find buffer overruns. A lot of this stuff can be automated, and it should be done right from the beginning of your project. And then on the top left here are your functional acceptance tests. Um, these are the tests that validate that the system delivers the expected value to your users. And these are typically end-to-end -end tests that run in a production-like environment using tools like WebDriver um, or whatever. And this stuff, I mean, it's harder to automate this stuff, but the tools and the patterns exist to do it. And there are many people who've been successful doing it. Um, so this is 2012. We should be doing this stuff in an automated fashion. When we have all these tests, what do we do? We create what's called a deployment pipeline. What is the deployment pipeline? You have a path to production. You have a path from check-in to release. And whatever that process is, you want to get visibility into that process. You want to be able to see the production readiness of any of your systems, what's deployed into a given environment, what validations has it been through, and so forth. You want to get feedback on the effects of every change you make to your system, whether that's database schema, infrastructure, source codes, test scripts, whatever. And finally, you want control. It should be possible for testers to self-service the build of their choice to a testing environment at the push of a button. It should be possible for operations people to self-service a build to staging or production at the push of a button. And what do we do once we have these things? We create a deployment pipeline. So you can see someone's made a change and they checked it into version control. That triggers the build and the unit tests. And this should run in a few minutes, certainly not more than 10 minutes. And in this case, it fails. We've done something stupid. At that point, everyone stops what they're doing. Someone volunteers to fix the problem. And people can carry on working, but nobody can check in unless they're the person fixing that problem. And you can enforce that in subversion by using a pre-commit hook to make sure that no one commits unless they're uh, fixing the build. So we fix that problem, the bill goes green, that triggers a downstream process, maybe comprehensive automated tests, um, and the, this goes red. And again, if it goes red, that means everyone stops what they're doing, someone works on fixing the problem as their highest priority, and then everyone else can carry on working, and you can still check in, but somebody is making fixing those tests the highest priority. And this is what I mean when I say you have to prioritize keeping the system working over doing work. If the system is broken, the highest priority of the team is to fix the system. Assuming we get a build where the acceptance tests go green, that means we have a build which has passed all the automated tests. That can go downstream to a tester. 
here's a new build. It has these changes, these new features, these bugs fixed, and they can self-service that build or any other build to their testing environment. And if that's good, it goes all the way to production, if you want. Again, there might be manual approvals in order to do this. So the idea is every change results in a build, and every build is a release candidate. Every build is a release candidate. And it's like a Greek epic. The hero wants to marry the beautiful woman, but first he must pass a series of tests. He has to fight the evil monster. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and then, that was actually quite scary. <laughs> And then, and then get the big pile of gold and finally have an emotional reunion with his father in the underworld. And then he can marry the beautiful woman. Thanks, Martin. Um, <laughs> and this is the job of the deployment pipeline. The build is the hero, and we want the, to release the build into production. But first, the build must pass a series of tests. And only if the build has passed the test can it then be deployed to production. The job of the deployment pipeline is to kill the build, to try and show that the build is not releasable. And if a build passes all these validations, manual and automated, then the build can be released. And if we have the slightest concern about pressing a button to release that build, what that means is our validations aren't good enough. And we need to fix those validations. And what this looks like, you can build a deployment pipeline with uh, any continuous integration tool. Uh, we at ThoughtWorks build one called Go, which is, of course, more elegant and powerful than the competition. Um, but you can use any CI tool. And, and what you should have is your process up here. I mean, this is a simple linear process. In real life, often more complex processes branch out and come back. So you can see the process here, and you can see the check-ins to version control down here. You can see who's worked on what. You know what check-ins to version control were done and what stories were being worked on, and which parts of your process that particular change has gone through. And I can press a button here to self-service this build to uh, a smoke testing environment um, or further on down the process. So one of the things that we want to do with continuous delivery is reduce the risk of release. How do we do that? First of all, we want to automate the process of provisioning our environments and maintaining them. So automatic provisioning, maintenance, automated deployment. And the second thing is ensure that everyone collaborates throughout the process. So there's three pillars to reducing the risk of release. One is DevOps, one is incrementalism, and one is decoupling deployment and release. So I'm briefly going to go through these three. Who's heard of DevOps here? OK, many of you. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, apart from them to say, you know, DevOps is basically trying to solve the problem that developers and operations hate each other. Why is this? Well, developers are measured according to throughput. Operations are measured according to stability. How could that go wrong? Well, it turns out there is an answer. And the answer is, let's be nice to each other. Why can't we just love one another? You know, your operations people, go and take them out for lunch. Go and, uh, go and buy a drink and buy them a drink and find out why they hate you. There's uh, a common anti-pattern when, as a development team, you put out a release and you go and have a party. And the operations people have to uh, actually make the system work. And about 11 o'clock at night, the system goes down and they call the developers and the developers say, you know, and they say to the developers, listen, the, the, the site's gone down. We need you to help us fix it. And the developers say, oh, I'm a bit drunk. Well, I can't have a look. And the operations people are very upset. Why are they upset? It's not because you're drunk. It's because you didn't invite them. Why didn't you invite them to the party? Invite them to the party. And when you invite them, make sure that the system isn't going to go down, because then they won't be able to come. And then they'll hate you again. So at the core of DevOps is this idea of creating a shared culture where everyone is focused on the same thing, delivering valuable software to our customers. That's why we all get out of bed every day. Automation, measurement of what we're doing, and sharing of tools and techniques and practices. Now, we're nearly out of time, so I just briefly want to touch on two um, patterns to help reduce the risk of releases. Um, one is that low-risk releases should be incremental. Uh, and there's a number of different patterns that I don't have time to go into, but I'm just going to explain one simple approach to low-risk releases. 
If you have a large system, the most dangerous and high risk thing you can do is release it all in one go. Instead, what you want to do is do it incrementally. So if you have static content, don't overwrite the old static content with the new stuff. Put it in a different directory so that you can switch between the two. If you have upstream services you depend on, don't deploy the new version of the service over the old version. Keep them running side by side. When Amazon Web Services release a new API for EC2, they don't overwrite the old one because that would break everyone using EC2. Instead, they release it side by side. So if you're using EC2, you can specify the version of the protocol you want to use in the URI. So they make them all available, and you as the consumer can choose which one you want to use. In the same way, with databases, Flickr, Etsy, Facebook are not releasing database changes multiple times a day. They're doing it once a week, because these are high-risk changes. And high-risk changes need to be managed differently from low-risk changes. But what they do is they make sure that um, the application can work with the old and the new version of the database. So first of all, you add new objects to the database. And then you deploy the new version of the application that depends on the new objects. And say, you might have an address field, and you might want to turn that into address one and address two. So you don't just delete the old address and create two new columns. What you do is you just add the new columns first. Then you deploy the app, and the app will try and read from the new columns. If they're null, it reads from the old columns. But it only writes to the new columns. And in that way, the application will lazily migrate the data. If you need to roll back, you can roll back. Everything will still work. And then eventually, once you're happy with the deployment, then you can do a batch copy of the data and remove the old column. But we always make changes to the database in an additive way. And we make sure that we can deploy the database independently of the application. And there's a similar technique that you can use for deploying the application incrementally, too, called blue-green deployments. And Martin has a blog entry on blue-green deployments. Uh, that's uh, this here. So if you search for this, you'll get to Martin's blog, and there's a nice article. The final thing I want to point out, well, the nearly final thing, is that release and deployment are not the same thing. And this is a problem for people translating my book into Portuguese, because in Portuguese, it's the same word. But I don't know if this is true in German. I'm guessing not. If you're all laughing at the Portuguese, you must be more sophisticated with your language, I'm guessing. Um, there's, a, there's an article in Facebook uh, by the Facebook release engineer, Chuck Rossi. And what Chuck Rossi says is that every major feature that Facebook are going to launch is already in production. Every major feature for the next six months is already in production. You just can't see it yet. So it's deployed, but it's not released. How do they do that? They use what's called feature toggles. So this is a very simple example. You have a configuration file, and wobbly foo bars are on, and your flighty fork handles feature is off. And you simply have an if-then element on the UI to control whether that can be seen. And then you can alter that at runtime. Now, this is a simple implementation where it's binary. What Facebook and Etsy do is it's not binary. They can control for the feature who can see that feature. And they can say, well, maybe 1% of our users can see that feature or only people inside Facebook can see that feature. And they actually have a toggle for everyone except TechCrunch editors can see a feature. This is true. Um, so using this, they can deploy a feature and test it with a small group of users and gradually ramp it up, see if it's going to be able to handle the load that's required um, before they roll it out to the entire world. And they can roll it back if they need to. And you can use the same technique to manage things further down in the stack. Uh, maybe you want to make a large-scale change to some part of your system. You can just use polymorphism and control which implementation is actually used at runtime. Um, and this is a very powerful technique. You can use feature toggles for multiple different things. You can use it to manage features that are taking a long time to get developed. You can use it to reduce loads on expensive features. Um, if there's high load in your system, they have all kinds of uses. But what they allow you to do mainly is decouple deployment from release. So there's a number of other tools, but that's really all I have time to go into. The last thing I want to say is that the people and the pattern, sorry, the patterns and the practices and the tools to implement this stuff exist. Nothing in the book is new. It's all stuff that has been tested and found to work in real life. And really, the main issues that we find are people. Um, uh, I think the core of Agile is really about 
experimenting, running experiments, applying the scientific method, running experiments, getting the results, uh, working out how to improve. And in process, uh, when, in terms of your development process, the key practice for me is the retrospective. The idea where we get together as a team once every week, once every two weeks, and we look at our process. What's going well, what's going badly? And then we think, well, how can we improve? What experiments can we run as a team to work out how to improve our way of working? And then you run those experiments, and you come back in two weeks' time and look at the results. You know, we, added, we did more automated testing. Did that improve things? Did it make things worse? And you just proceed in that way. And that's all you really need to do. I, I should have told you that at the beginning. Then you could have all gone and had a drink. Um, but that really is the key to Agile, working out how to run experiments uh, and get better at what you do. Um, rotate people between groups. The best way to get developers to write production-ready code is to give them pages. So when the site goes down, the developers get called out at 2 o'clock in the morning. That tends to make developers write more stable code, in my experience. Um, so rotate developers through support and operations. Ro rotate operations people through development teams so they can give them that feedback. Make sure the information on the stability of your system, the state of the deployment pipeline, all that stuff, all those nice, pretty displays you have in ops, put them all the way through your organization. LCDs are cheap. And finally, the way to implement continuous delivery, for the love of God, do not start up a continuous delivery project to implement continuous delivery. We should be implementing continuous delivery in an incremental way, the same way we implement our features, through continuous improvement through the scientific method of finding out where our problems are, running some experiments to try and improve them, working out what the results were, and, and, and carrying on in that way. Um, so that's all I have, uh, and it's uh, nearly quarter past nine, uh, so let's take some questions. <laughs>